What's up, everybody? Thanks for listening to the WhatCast. We hope you're all doing good. We hope you're surviving this. Whatever, it's winter still. I don't know. I, I, weather everywhere is going crazy. Mike, you're saying you're getting beat up right now. Yeah, but like all this past week, it's been in the 50s. And we even got up into the 60s one day this week. But yeah, now we're back to snow. Last week, we got hit with fucking almost a foot of snow. The day before, it was... I think 63. So what the fuck? I don't know, man. Whoa, that's weird. Yeah. It's not, I, I would like to say that's that's abnormal weather behavior for this time of year up here, but it's not. It's it's not. <laughs> I mean, we've had snow. We've had snow mid-May. Granted, it doesn't stay, but it, it comes and then, you know, the days bookending it will be in the 60s. It, it just, it doesn't make fucking sense. Yeah, last week I remember seeing something about how there was like a blizzard in California that fucked up a freeway pretty good. Yeah, just Mother Nature trying to kill us. Yeah. She's like, just fuck off already. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. She's just like a giant dog trying to shake off the fleas that are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe this will work. No, we're we're tenacious little fuckers. Right. Sorry, ma'am. She's just so big, it takes her longer to act. So, like, in 20 more years, it'll be her response from this winter going, colder than cold. Yeah. Yeah. And in 30 years' time, it'll just be in- inhabitable for people. <laughs> Here's hoping. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see everybody in the apocalypse. The icy, frozen apocalypse. Yeah. Well, actually, no offense, everyone, but it's the apocalypse. So, honestly, I hope I don't see any of you. That's true. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> but until the uh, day of eternal snow comes, Mike, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, I, I wanted to, to talk about a fun little case from, well, I guess it came out in the 70s, but it was it started in 66. So I got this book recently, and it's a book from my childhood that that I used to get from my local library, like all the fucking time. It's it's a book that I frequently thought about as an adult because of some of the illustrations in there. Like they just stood out to me when I was a kid. So that so it was like this piece of nostalgia that I that I just kind of had on the the periphery of my memory. I. Couldn't remember the name of the book. Couldn't remember the author. I remembered what the cover of the book looked like. And I remembered some of the illustrations in there. And uh, about a month ago, I just happened to be watching some random video on YouTube. And uh, it was, these guys were in a, a vintage toy store. And it was just like all all shit from my youth, basically, like all all the action figures I grew up with and all that shit. So you know, I was taking the trip down memory lane watching this video, and it just happened that this store had a used book rack, and one of the guys was looking for first prints of Stephen King books. So he's going through the books, and I just see the top half of the cover of this book, and as soon as I saw it. It all came back to me. So instantly I had to go track it down. The book's called Aliens on Earth by by Joshua Strickland. And uh, so so I'm looking all over the internet on Amazon. It's a fucking ridiculous amount of money because it's been out of print since 77. So it's... it's, Oh my God. Yeah. It's been out of print for a while. Um, I ended up finding a used book dealer online where I was able to pick it up for a very reasonable price. So I, I grabbed it and I was looking through. I mainly grabbed it just because of the pictures that I remembered from when I was a kid. And it's, it, I say pictures, but it's not like a, uh, it's not a kid's book. It's, I, I just had, I've, I've always kind of been drawn to this sort of stuff as, you know, I've, I've said a thousand times on the show that like this shit's been my jam since, since I could read. 
but I wanted to get the book. Like, I don't rem- I couldn't remember any of the contents of the book, like any of the stories or anything. I just remember the pictures. So I wanted to get it one for nostalgia reasons and two to see what kind of cool stories were in there. Cause, cause again, this is a UFO book from the seventies. So it's, they're covering a lot of different stuff than would be covered in, in modern books. Um, uh, so I was going through it and, uh, I found a lot of good stuff for, for quick and the weird in that. So for, for people that like the really weird alien UFO stories, tune into our Patreon in, in the coming month. Um, cause I'll, I'm, I'm, I've got some stuff ready to go for quick and the weird. So if that's your jam, go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash the whatcast. But I digress. The, in this book, I found a story of these communications from, uh, it, it just, it, the, the chapter was called Wolf 424. So immediately, like, that's pretty intriguing as a, as a, as a name, Wolf 424. Like, what is that? Yeah, when you uh, sent me a text about what we are going to cover last week, I was like, Wolf 424, this could be anything. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it like it sounds like some fifty sci fi bullshit or something. Yeah, I was like, is this a Wolfman soldier code cracker? Is this a secret project? I wish that would have been fucking awesome. <laughs> but unfortunately, Wolf four two four is not anything weird or paranormal. It it so happens that Wolf four two four is the name of a binary star system that's about 14 light years away from our solar system. But it's a, it consists of two red dwarf stars. Um, and it's located like if, if you're looking in the night sky, it's located in the constellation Virgo. Uh, but the, we weren't aware that it was a binary star system at first, but it was just the, the binary stars were discovered by a Dutch American astronomer named Dirk real in 1941 and he he figured this out based on looking at photographs of what he thought was one star but in looking at it he noticed that it was like elongated and based on that he was able to determine that this was actually a binary star system so it's made up of two stars wolf 424 a and wolf 424 b and both of them are relatively cool as far as stars go, um, but their main sequence red dwarf stars. Four two four A is roughly the size of one hundred and forty seven Jupiters, and four two four B is a little bit smaller. It's roughly one hundred thirty six Jupiters. Damn. So yeah, pretty fucking you know big by like when comparing them to to a planet but f- as far as stars go it's not all all that big um but they are the two dimmest known objects within 15 light years of our sun and uh while we were observing it since their discovery uh, it wasn't until 1967 which is a year after the initial contact allegedly uh, it wasn't until 1967 that it was discovered that these stars were flare stars, which means that the the stars will just randomly uh, brighten and dim at just random intervals. But that's so. The name Wolf 424 is a lot cooler than than it would seem. <laughs> it's not. It's not like some weird alien transmission or anything, but. The reason it it's called the communications from Wolf 424 is because there's these beings that live on a. It, they said it's the second planet from this from their star system, or from their their stars. But because their stars are smaller and dimmer, um, their their position as the second planet in the star system. Uh, gives them around the same type of uh, radiation from their stars that we get from the sun. So, so they're kind of them being the second planet in their sol- solar system. That's that solar system's Goldilocks zone. So that's that's where they come from. But 
it, it started in 66, but it, it wasn't known in English until the 70s. And uh, in 1971, one of the editors of a British publication called Flying Saucer Review, uh, his name was Gordon Creighton, he received a report from a Spanish writer, Antonio Rivera, that gave him uh, detailed reports and examples of communications with beings from another planet. And they were known, uh, the planet was known as Umo, and so they were the referred to as the Umites. So the Umites had been known to uh, European UFO researchers because of previous reports that came from Spain and France where ships appeared and apparently had con contact with a bunch of different people. Billy Meyer alleges to have been in contact with these people as well. And he knew them as Umites? Yeah, so with with the Umites and the Billy Meyer thing, uh, so he had contact with the Palladians, if I remember correctly. Um, but the there's this thing called the the Galactic Federation, and um, they all have like these these special like uniforms called smart suits, and they they all have like these they look similar but they're different colors, but they kind of work together towards a common goal so like if one group will make contact sometimes members from another group will also make contacts and they're distinguished a lot of the ones that are in this group would be like the the humanoid looking ones the nordic looking ones so like the pladians the umites i can't even remember what what the other ones are but the pladians have like this this kind of shimmering white uniform whereas the umites have this shimmering gold color Ooh, they're better yeah. yeah so i mean that's but so i i think his primary connections were with the pladians um but he did have contact with umites however i i do want to state he described them and someone painted this really nice picture of of a umite woman in a f field of flowers with with a billy meyer style style ufo flying behind her um but he produced these pictures that he claimed were umites um but what it was was actually pictures taken from a live performance of a sing and dance group known as the gold diggers wow. and it had been proven years later that that was the picture that he provided as being evidence of an alien visitor. It was from a live performance of the gold diggers. <laughs> so, I mean, I've got a lot of problems with Billy Meyer. We've, we've talked about him. We've had his, what was he, his personal representative or what? I can't remember. Yeah, the uh, personal representative for American media, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We've had him on the show a couple of times and, and I mean it's a cool story and all, but there's just so much going against him that I I just I can't buy into it. So um but a lot of this stuff with the Galactic Federation it it really veer starts to veer into like the the new age spiritualist kind of territory and it it, it all just kind of has like the same feeling like we're we're here to observe we 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 encourage you to find ways of peace but we can't interfere you know all that bullshit but it this kind of follows in the same sort of uh sort of path but this has been written about by this by a historian named Mike Dash and uh he wrote a whole book on it unfortunately i don't have that book so i'm kind of going based on the research from the Aliens on Earth book, as well as uh, I, because that book was dated in the 70s, I had to kind of look for some more modern information as well. So um, while I don't have the book, I've got a lot of stuff that he wrote about them. So, um, you know, sorry, I can't get into more detail, I guess, if there's a extreme desire for the, the nitty gritty on these, I'll, I'll buy the book and cover the Umites in detail later. But, um, 
just know that I will do it under protest because this, this stuff isn't my jam typically like the, the weird UFO cult stuff. It's just so fucking, it just seems like a bunch of fucking confused hippies. That's, but anyway, this Mike Dash guy in, in his book, he says that the, the, uh, following of the Umites or he, he calls it Umoism, uh, started February 6th, 1966 in Madrid. Uh, so on that day, a man by the name of Jordan Pena claimed that he saw this huge, uh, circular object with three legs and on the underside of the craft was a symbol that looked like I, and I know once I describe this, I know for a fact you've seen drawings of this, but it's a, it's a disc shaped object and the symbol on the bottom has three vertical lines joined by a horizontal bar. So it looks like an H with an extra line in the middle. Okay. So um, apparently that is similar to the alchemical sign for Uranus or Uranus. <laughs> are, they, are they trying to move away from the anus aspect of Uranus? Yeah. Yeah, I I know it's pronounced Uranus, but I guess it's supposed to be Uranus, which is way better. Yeah, I like that. That sounds like it might yeah. be a part of like the Dune planet system. Yeah, it's awesome. But not not long after this this sighting, a author, another guy from Madrid, an author of a uh, he he's ba- basically like a, a guy who covers UFO stories. But he received several photographs from an anonymous source, and the photographs were of similar craft to the one that was reported by Pena, and they were all bearing the same symbol on the underside. Um, within a few weeks, there was there's this uh, contactee from Spain named Fernando Sisma Manzano, and he started to become involved. Uh, when he started getting these lengthy typewritten documents, which the author of the the documents were claiming to be from the spacefaring race called the Umites. And the contents of the material that was delivered to Creighton contained all this information, but he wasn't able to actually publish it in English until 1974 because of the time it took him to translate. So, again, he received them in 71, but it took him three years to translate them and put them out. So, in the report that he got from this Ribera guy, it was explained that Ribera, the guy who who sent it, had first learned of the communications in 1967. So, he didn't hear about these initial sightings when they happened. He found out about them in 67, when a man from Barcelona approached him who told to tell him about a friend of his who was a civil engineer that had been receiving these weird phone calls from mysterious beings uh, who claimed to be from another planet. And they would share like they would they would have these these like technical conversations about about the work that he was doing and and I guess just kind of like having scientific discussions And then they also started sending him written reports on technical subjects. Um, Through through this contact, Ribera ended up learning about 20 other people in Spain who had been receiving similar typewritten letters from beings that claimed to be Umites. And he also learned that there were people in France, East Germany, Argentina, and a few other people scattered throughout the world. So I guess if you believe the Billy Meyer stuff, throw him in there. And I th- what, he was in Switzerland, I believe. Um, but they had all been receiving similar letters uh, claiming to be from the Umites. And the letters were spanning topics ranging from science, technology, to philosophy. And they... M- most of the con- most of the people that they contacted they seemed to be involved in some field of science or they were ufo researchers and nobody of any like real power like no politicians no world leaders no celebrities nothing like that were contacted um and it it seemed to be by design according to the umites cuz they claim that 
they were only on earth to be passive observers and students to learn more about earth and the people that live here and our civilization. Um, but they are morally bound not to interfere with our development and they are forbidden from offering, quote, new doctrines, new mathematical concept or panaceas for social or pathological ills. So again, this is going back to the the new age stuff where where they you know lay down the the uh, I guess philosophy that they follow like like if you want to have a better life, a better civilization, and learn to be one with with your space brothers, you need to adopt peace and love and and harmony and all that stuff. You know, speak the light language, vibrate your crystals, all that stuff. But in those communications to all those those alien hippie groups they always claim that these beings tell them that they cannot interfere they they cannot interfere they're just here to observe and they can try to guide us but they can't get involved they can't just like straight up be like here is technology that you can use for for better forever it's just not how it goes with them so they it, it just kind of follows the standard stuff at the that that they go through at the time um but they did provide some interesting information um they they kind of give some insight into the nature of reality uh there was a report that they sent out to all of their contactees that was called new concepts of space and one of the umites quote unquote one of the writers uh, stated that the human's view of space is simplistic and not corresponding at all to the true reality of the cosmos because our view of space is based on mathematical and geometric abstractions and we perceive the world around us in three dimensions. Um, so our, our perception of three-dimensional space is a mental creation that is inherent to to our race i guess um claim that even if we account for the fourth dimension like in in um, einstein's theory of relativity uh, our perception is still considered superficial from a cosmic perspective and they claim that their race is aware that the the universe likely has innumerable innumerable dimensions um but their race specifically is only aware of 10. So they're, well, we're stuck in, in four dimensions. They, they're, they're in 10. So like they're viewing things from a completely different angle. Um, but they go on to further claim that the subatomic particles that our scientists w are, are doing so much work on are actually an illusion and that they should be looking into these into uh what they term space folds or warps and that using these space folds they're able to take shortcuts without following the straight lines that light has to travel in and they say that these lines like the the way that light travels is just an illusion so i don't really know what that means I, i'm not too well versed in astrophysics or anything like that so I, I don't really know how uh what how light travels or anything so I, I can't really comment on that um, but they're claiming that these lines that light travels in are illusory hmm. but you being able to use these these folds in in space uh, they were able to make the travel from their star system to ours in eight or nine months but it takes light 14 years to travel here from there. Damn. Yeah. Really uh, rub it in our face there. We're way behind. Yeah. Yeah. They also have, they sent out a philosophical paper. And in this one, they explained that beings like, like us humans or also like them or presumably other humanoid species, um, we all create an eternal or external reality as soon as we think of of things like the way that we perceive our world 
is created by our perception of it, essentially, is what they're saying. Um, and they say that the external reality, if bent in conformance with our mental process, is modified as soon as we focus our consciousness upon it. So we, they're saying that we can shape our own reality, which is kind of like the way magic works. Like you're, you're putting your uh, will and intention into the universe and trying to shape the universe to that will. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting, but they, they say that just because you are the creator of your own world, that's not to say that beyond this, there's not, it's not to say that a creator doesn't exist, you know, whether that be a God or some sort of divine creator. Um, but they said this creator would, the thoughts would have no connection with our thinking processes as dimensional beings. So we would have just been like a manifestation of this thing. Uh, and then after we were created, that's it. They leave us to figure it out on our own. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dick. It's like, here, yeah, figure it out, guys. Fuck off. But that, I, I, I think I, I just wanted to mention that part on the, the philosophy just because um, a lot of these new age religions do kind of have a hand in like at least a little bit in the occult. Um, so it's interesting that these, these beings are, are telling these people that their will manifests reality. Right. Right. Now I know you were talking about this book coming from the seventies and that's where the gold is. That's where the good stuff is. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I recently went to my favorite bookstore two times to find some cool books to 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 research stuff in and it seems like anything like after the 80s is like strange mysteries what happened to amelia Earhart? i'm like fuck you know like <laughs> I yeah know. where's the weird shit man yeah i know about stonehenge and the loch ness monster but i mean i don't know can would you agree that like the people saying that the aliens were here to to rub our back and teach us how to fucking grow crops out of rocks uh, were like from the like 60s to 70s before they're like I would say 80s to 90s they were talking about like different races in general some being bad do you think the people in the early days didn't realize they were leaving the door open for the fact that there has to be bad aliens as well just to explain the other shit that was going on at the time like abductions and mutilations I it, maybe like it makes me wonder because a lot of these, so, so this one's a bit different because this, all this stuff was actually done over phone calls and through typewritten letters. Um, so this is a bit different, but a lot of the, the weird UFO cults from the, the sixties and seventies, um, they, they seem to center around some, uh, a specific individual that would channel the information. Um, and basically they would go into like, it, it was like a seance where instead of summoning a ghost or the spirit of the deceased or whatever, they were bringing forth aliens, which to me makes me, if, if real, let me start out there. If real, um, makes me even believe stronger that this, all this shit is related in some way. And, um, like I want it because I, cause I, I got to think like if you're channeling or if you're a medium and you're you're kind of tapping into energy, I've, I got to feel like you're not getting it's it's not like someone's talking to you. You know what I'm saying? Like like it's not like you've got a voice in your ear saying, say this, say this and say this. I, I it's probably more like getting a feeling of uh, like ideas and scenarios and and things like that you know just more more general maybe a little more abstract um than actual specific words and statements right you know and you're just kind of translating the feeling that you're getting from these right i totally agree i think a lot of these people especially in the ufo field uh when they you know i mean like the words communication are thrown around when it's it's probably more just impressionism really and just a conveying feelings yeah. like you're saying 
Yeah, and and we know from from so many other stories about UFOs, about Bigfoot, about hauntings, that these things are able to manipulate emotions. They're they're able to instill fear or or sadness or depression or you know even in some cases feelings of ecstasy. Um, so so they're clearly capable of tapping into whatever whatever drives our emotional spectrum and they're able to to manipulate that to their ends for whatever means i mean we don't know why but that's what they do so it's it wouldn't surprise me if that was like their form of communication you know like they want you to feel afraid so you feel afraid or they want you to feel a sense of peace so they they instill peace on you Mm, right right so i i don't know like with with these things with with all these these ufo cults and and the the channeling thing um it it seems very much like a a john smith sort of thing like like i'm the only one that can read these things and i will tell you what they say you know so like any asshole could so long as you can uh sprinkle in some information that you know you you likely probably wouldn't know according to most people and you know to make it believable um you know <laughs> you, you could trick a lot of people and be like no the aliens they're communicating with me and they want you to to listen to what they have to say but they're only going to talk to me and i will tell you what they're saying yes tell us mike tell us Tell us what the aliens say. The aliens say that you want to give me 50 of your American dollars right now and also a cheeseburger. Yes, I will give you 50 American dollars at you. Thank you. And then I'll, you know, take their $50 and eat the cheeseburger and, and tell them that the aliens are pleased. Because if if you feed me and pay me and I eat that cheeseburger and spend that money, it goes through me directly to the aliens you new lords and saviors <laughs> yeah so by sustaining me you're actually fueling the ufos because i'm i'm attached to them so my energy is a direct link to powering their ships so you know go to go to patreon and give me all the dollars i want them all if you want the aliens to come that's all i say yeah i'm gonna i'm opening up a special tier in patreon um, this this month, it's it's going to be fifty dollars in a cheeseburger tier, um, where all all support from that tier goes directly to my gut, which then goes directly <laughs> to the alien spaceship. So um, be on the lookout for that, and I will expect everyone that's hearing this episode to to sign up. So um, if you don't, then you not only hate me, but you hate aliens and you hate. <laughs> You hate this galaxy. You you're spitting in the face of the entire Galactic Federation, and, and a furtherment of I mean, our of our race. Not to to mention, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm an emissary for them guys, and if you're if you are going to disrespect them like that, I, they're. I mean, if you're going to disrespect me like that, I'm I am their emissary on Earth. I'm basically like the 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 human Jesus of the Galactic Federation, guys. <laughs> so. I mean, the least you can do is 50 bucks in a cheeseburger every month. Come on. Come on. Intergalactic Jesus needs cheeseburgers. I know. I really do, guys. And that 50 bucks is just to show you care. The cheeseburgers is where it's really at, but the 50 bucks is also... And, and I don't make these rules, guys. This is coming straight from the aliens. They told me in, in my latest uh, conversation with them all about it. And they revealed to me how doing that would save the world um but you just you gotta you gotta go on faith on this one because it's not uh it's not something i can divulge to you i've got to kind of keep it under my hat for now but when the time's right everyone who donated fifty dollars in a cheeseburger will know and and you'll be under the protection of the aliens so anybody that doesn't you guys are fucked (laughs) yeah just imagine the thing about all the people who fell for stuff like that back then just it's weird to look back on even in the 90s dude i was watching something about heaven's gate 
Like they found, like recently, I don't know if it was recently, but there, somebody released some interviews with some of those folks before they did that, and it's just it's bizarre to to go the whole spaceman angle and people buy even in they even buy into that. Well, yeah, because I mean, aliens aren't going to reveal themselves to anybody, Mateo. Like, if aliens are revealing themselves to you, you got to be kind of important. I mean, they're they're. Do you think it's a coincidence that there was a fucking comet streaking across the sky when the aliens came back to town? Certainly not. I believe that those people didn't die and that they are currently rocking and rolling on a spaceship trailing behind a comet right now. <laughs> That's what they're doing. The, the people that bailed, they missed out. Sucks to be them. All you had to do was shed your mortal co- your mortal coil and uh, you could have been a fucking space ghost cruising the cosmos. You missed out, buddy. <laughs> oh. Wimp, wimp. Or who knows, maybe they just became fucking whatever the alien ghosts that Scientologists want to fill their bodies with. I don't remember what they're called, but maybe that's what happened to them. So maybe you did maybe you did dodge a bullet there, guys. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're not filling Tom Cruise's butt hole right now, so I consider that a plus. One hundred percent. I mean, unless you're into Tom Cruise's butthole, in which case I, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, I mean, like even I think if you're into Tom Cruise's butthole, I don't think you're you're gonna be into the way that you're going into his butthole that they're doing. Listen, you don't know how fucking alien ghosts work. I don't think, don't assume that you know the nature of their being. I think that they're highly efficient and they're just gonna transform you into some like suppository. They can't. They don't have time to waste. You're gonna go in You're there. An ectoplasmic pill. Yeah, it goes straight up the pooper. Right up there, and they move on with their day. Tom Cruise is back to, uh, and he just absorbs you, and you're like, "No, this isn't what I wanted." And then you'll hear me go, "Yep, told you." Yeah, the the last thought that goes through your head, Mateo was right. I didn't want to be right. <laughs> I didn't want that for you. I'm sorry. Wow, how the fuck did we end up here? Huh. You you want to get back to the Umites, maybe? Yeah, I <laughs> okay. Umite it up. So let me let me give you the history according to the Umites. The history of the Umites on Earth according to the Umites. And again, this is this is coming through channeling from a group of people who are supposed. No, no, this isn't channeling. These are these are typewritten letters. Oh and shit! Phone calls. Okay, okay. Yep, from these these beings that that are human esque. In appearance, but they're, I mean, they're like the, the classic Nordics, but, um, the Umites have taller foreheads, I guess. So that's how you can distinguish them because not only are like, not only are they the tall, you know, pale blonde people, but they've got big ass foreheads. So that's, that's how, you know, I think, they're not Palladians. I think I knew, of, I knew a few of them in high school. Oh my God. They're everywhere. So according to their communications there the umites are claiming that they discovered earth in 1948 when they received a faint signal uh that had a frequency of uh 413.44 megacycles and they detected it but they were unable to decipher it and the signal lasted for almost seven minutes um and then it just faded out but that seven minutes was enough time for the Umites to lock in on the galactic coordinates and find the general area, well, find the planet, and then find the general area on the planet where the message came from. So their letters claim that the message that they received, they initially thought was binary code um, because it was a series of dashes. So they thought it was binary code, and so they, using that, they typed in the, the you know, I, I don't know what they're fucking, what sorts of technology they have, but they took the, the code and they were able, in attempting to decipher it, they weren't able to find a message, but they found that it built this graph of a geometric figure that they knew as uh, Ga, is what they called it. So it was a, a figure that was known to them already, and it, they had the name of Ga. Um, so based on this, they designated our planet Uyaga, which in their language means the cold star of Ga. And upon arriving to Earth and learning more, you know, once they became acclimated and learned about our, our 
language and communication and everything, they found out that the message that they received was Morse code, not binary. So they, they completely got all that wrong. But they arrived to Earth, according to the Umite communications, they arrived to Earth on March 28th, 1950, at 4.17 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, which is uh, the uh, time zone where like Great Britain is. They arrived in an area in France outside the town of La Jave, and according to the letters... There were four male Umites and two female Umites that were left behind as an expeditionary team. And Creighton claimed in his report that uh, there was a lot of strangeness that occurred in La Jave around that time. Um, but I wasn't able to, I, I didn't have access to his, initial, to his original report. So I don't know what type of strangeness he was referring to. Uh, but apparently among researchers at the time in Mar late March 1950, there was some weirdness that was occurring in that area. So that's that's kind of interesting. But after spending time adapting to Earth, the Umites decided they, they were going to investigate the source of the signal that they had picked up back in 1948. And through their investigation, they were able to find out that the uh, signal they received was actually broadcast from a Norwegian ship that was experimenting with high frequencies in long distance communication by bouncing signals off the ionosphere. And the signal that they sent was sent in February of 1934. So it didn't reach UMO until uh, 1948, so 14 years later. Hmm. Which, as I mentioned earlier, is the distance in light years between their star system and ours. So from there, then they started reaching out to the different scientists and researchers and everything and sharing this information without giving too much away. And they were claiming that the information that they were provided, they didn't care if it was disseminated. One, because there was no proof that it was from aliens. So there was no way that you know, they wouldn't give their their mission wouldn't be compromised because they're not providing proof that aliens exist and they're not they're not sharing like mathematic principles or any technology or anything like that. So it was it was seemed to be okay, I guess. Okay. So in the in the years since then, I I guess even even back then, um, there weren't that many researchers outside of Spain that really took this story very seriously. Um, the photographic evidence that was brought up was considered to be highly suspect, and the letters that were being distributed, they were more sophisticated and, and technically written than a lot of the uh, contactee communication that, that was coming out at the time that would have been through like channeled means. There was nothing in these letters that indicates that it would have been from anywhere other than Earth. Like there's no, there were no revelations in any of these that wasn't already known to modern science at the time. And in fact, there were some inconsistencies that were found. Um, there was a lot of the a lot of the scientific subjects that were described, um, including the stuff they just, they talked about with astrophysics and cosmology, uh, as well as evolution and philosophy. Uh, some of this information that was there was considered to be completely just like fringe scientific theories at the time, um, hmm. but there was some of it that was considered to be actually scientifically accurate. Jerome Clark actually looked into it in, in 1993. Um, and he, he mentioned that Jacques Vallée argued that the scientific content that was provided in these letters was knowledgeable. So it would be somebody who did their research, but it wasn't necessarily groundbreaking. He, he termed it as being unremarkable and he compared it to if uh, an author were to do 
a lot of research on a science fiction novel. Um, he said this would be about where you'd compare the science references. So a, a, anybody who put in an amount of effort to research this information would be able to provide this information. Um, and so in the 60s, this information was considered, you know, accurate and plausible. But as we move on in the decades, um, a lot of this information that they were providing becomes dated, which obviously shows that whoever wrote these letters was writing it um, based on science at the time. Because if these were aliens that were more highly advanced than than we were, then obviously their knowledge of science and everything would be would be leaps and bounds beyond ours. It wouldn't have been dated within a few decades yet. Right, right. In this it, case, it was. This, are these people who always have the peaceful alien thing who, who claim they have contact, I, I wish they would just do the Star Trek path, you know, just have the aliens come down, show you an equation that's beyond human comprehension, and then explain it to where it is human comprehension like isn't that like the most peaceful uh, like a forward thinking way to prove that they they are who they are you'd think so right yeah but yeah no dice though but these these guys they um so so i i mentioned a few times the the 14 light years right but when they first started communicating in the 60s they wrote that they came from a planet that orb orbited Wolf 424, but at the time, they said that their star was 3.685 light years from the sun. And, and that was the estimated distance from the star system to our star system in the late 30s. But after additional measurements by astronomers, uh, they were able to estimate that it was actually 14.3 light years from our star system. So uh, one of the one of the people that were in contact named Fernando Sesma, uh, he asked the Umites about this and and why you know why did you say it was this many light years when it's actually this many light years, and they sent him a letter. In that same year, he asked the question, and they said that the real, the real distance, or the first measurement they provided, was the real distance measured in the three-dimensional framework, while the second, the fourteen point three, is the apparent distance traveled by light. So they, uh, I guess, claim that that in three-dimensional space, the time, the distance is different somehow than uh, the distance that light has to travel. So hmm. it, it's weird that they mentioned the three-dimensional framework when they had also said that they see the, the world in 10 dimensions. Like, why wouldn't it, you just say in the 10-dimensional framework, this is how far it is, but in in your you know substandard human measuring of things, 14.3 is accurate because you guys suck. <laughs> but the the general consensus is that Umoism was just an elaborate hoax. The person, because this is world spanning, um, it's thought that there's multiple people that were involved in it. Uh, but so far, the only person who's claimed responsibility for it is Jose Luis Jordan Pena. And uh, he is the only one who is claiming any responsibility for it, which is kind of interesting there's there's no one else who's coming to to say that they had any hand in it or that and he hasn't said that there was anybody else that helped him either but also he was the one who produced that for or claimed to have that first sighting as well so he kicked it off in the 60s but yeah he's claiming that it was all him and then there weren't any aliens and that so i'm wondering if the, if he started something and then other people just kind of ran with it which is easy to to believe back then that stuff was kind of going wild at the time yeah yeah and so even though it's widely considered to have been an elaborate hoax like most of these 
the uh, channeling stuff and UFO cults have been, there is still a small group that there's a cult in Bolivia called the Daughters of Umo. And they still, I guess, apparently receive communications from the Umites. And, and uh, I, I mean, I guess they don't worship them, but I mean, essentially that's what they're doing, you know. They're cult based on the the uh, idea that they're communicating with aliens. So somebody somewhere is being a phony and collecting money and and whatever from the rest of the cult. And and they say they're getting communications from the Umites to this day. Uh, allegedly. Wow. All right. I mean, I, I would I would say that that claim is dubious at best, but <laughs> uh, yeah, allegedly. The the Umites are are still kicking around. They imagine if they're real and like they they for a while they had like all these pen pals and and like oh man this is great and then everyone just kind of drops off and like oh man we're so lonely and then this little group in in Bolivia starts picking up that phone again like yay we have friends again yeah and unfortunately it's just this group of girls and they're like fuck like I mean it's cool because we have someone to talk to but like. I wish we had, you know, more people to talk to. Like, <laughs> you guys are you guys are cool and all, but it's you know, we always have to talk to you. All right, ladies, we need to figure out this YouTube algorithm thing. Yeah, <laughs> get get us a get us somewhere on YouTube if you could, please, and thank you. Your next mission: start a TikTok. <laughs> yes. You must TikTok the words of the Umites. <laughs> Who might say, give Mike $50 and a cheeseburger every month? Go get them, ladies. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast? Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.